When I'm not trying to come down after accidentally ingesting some of the dust at the bottom of a Cinnamon Toast Crunch box. I like to answer questions to get on YouTube, so let's get to it. You need more silly faces in your thumbnails to get the clicks. Arrow game pretty strong, but we need to know that you made a video that is so good that your jaw literally dropped through the center of the earth. So if you don't know, the number one way to be successful on YouTube is to look like an absolute fool in your thumbnails. Now, there's scientifically proven things that are supposed to get people to click on your videos. And again, if you don't know, it's not really about how many subscribers you have. If notifications aren't turned on, you're not gonna see somebody's video unless it has a high click-through rate, which is how YouTube determines to like serve you different pieces of content. Now, generally, my click-through rate is pretty trash because I usually title things kind of honestly. <laughs> Now, I have been doing a little bit better at adding arrows. The red arrow in some of the thumbnails always seems to work. It almost is kind of disheartening by how well it works, but again, science has proven that if we see a red arrow, we're gonna click on it. The other thing that you're supposed to do is make an absolutely ridiculous face in your thumbnail, put a close-up on it, and again, look like a fool. Like uh, Stevie T is a great example of this. And again, no hate or whatever. He does this thing. I think it's kind of funny. It's definitely not for me. I don't really care if this channel is no longer successful because I refuse to kind of play that clickbait thumbnail game. I would rather go back to serving tables than having YouTube turn me into a clown. So every now and then I might actually find like an interesting looking part from a thumbnail, but I feel like actually posing for a stupid looking thumbnail is just... Uh, it's, it's a bridge too far for me to cross, but I don't know. Stay tuned. We'll see. <laughs> no subject. Keep on talking, buddy. Lanky fellow. Such a waste lesson. Never been called a lanky fellow before, but he felt the need to follow up the next day. Such a stupid class, fellow. <laughs> so it was so bad, he watched another video a full day afterwards and then dropped the lanky from his insult. I actually, one of my favorite things is getting insulted from people in different areas of the world where English is not their first la uh, language. And, and then looking it up on the internet to see what it means. I've been called like a chutya a lot of the time. Lanky Fellow is definitely a new one, but I, ca I kind of like Lanky Fellow. So uh, again, if you're a Lanky Fellow, please let me know in the comments and we can stay Lanky strong. <laughs> where in a chord progression would you use a minor nine? All right, so minor nine chords you can always find on the two chord or the six chord in any key, all right? So if you take the people's key, the key of G, G, A, you can use A minor nine, B, C, D, E, you can use E minor nine. It's really easy to make a minor nine chord. If you just have like an a, a minor bar chord like that, just take your pinky off the D string and put it on the same fret on the high E string. So that right there is the sound of an A minor nine chord. But more to the point, like on a guitar, usually it's a little bit different than, uh, you know, maybe spelling a chord on a piano. Technically a minor nine chord is a root note, a minor third, a perfect fifth, a flat seven, and then a minor nine, which is the same as the second note in the scale, okay? So basically, if you think about it, you can always find the nine in any key, just take the root note and just go a whole step from that. So the ninth note and A minor is B. It's the same as the second note, okay? So you can think of an A minor 9 as any A minor 7 chord with a B in it, okay? It has to be an A minor 7 before it can be an A minor 9. Now, while that's technically true, on a guitar you generally don't always have to fulfill all the actual notes to get kind of like an A minor 9 sound. For instance, like an A minor 7, you can play just like this a lot, just the 5th fret on the E string. D string and G string. Now I don't have a fifth in there. I really just have a root, a seven, and a third. Because we have, you know, most of the time we only have six strings, we can imply a lot of these different notes. So again, I think that's kind of the sound of it. A cool way to get an A minor nine sound is actually by just taking your pinky if you have a root A. Five, five on the E string, seven on the A string, seven on the D string, and then just taking your pinky and going to the ninth fret. Technically, that would be like a suspended chord, like a suspended two chord. But on a guitar, again, there isn't like a huge difference. It's more kind of contextual in my personal opinion, right? So like an A suspended two or a minor nine, there's 
definitely a difference there for sure, but it's just kind of like being able to understand why it is a minor nine or why it is like a suspended chord. Again, a suspended chord isn't major or minor. That major minor third right there kind of really determines whether it's a minor nine on a guitar or not. More than that, I think it's also worth noting which minor chord cannot become a minor nine chord in a progression, and that would be the three chord, right? So in the key of G, G, A, B. The third note is a B. B minor is a chord in G in the key of G major. B minor seven is a chord in the key of G major. But B minor nine has a C sharp in it, which is outside of the key. Now that doesn't mean you can't use it. By all means, please use it. It'll sound pretty much mostly right in any kind of progression in G major. Like if we have like a one to a four to a minor nine. That doesn't sound so bad, but yeah, technically we're going outside of the key to add that. I think a really cool thing to do to maybe brush up on what chords go in a progression is just taking maybe like the highest four or even three strings and doing some of the chord voicings on there. And even if it's like, okay, like here's a G major bar chord. If I just take the highest three strings and get the third fret on the E string, B string, and fourth fret on the G string, and then running that into the two chord, A minor, and then you could add that second note. Again, having this right here, I'm thinking of it as an A minor nine, but even though technically if you like punch that into like a, like a phone app chord chart, it wouldn't tell you that's a minor nine. In fact, it might even say this is a major seven. And then doing it here, this is B's spot. 7th fret on the high E string to the 8th fret on the high E string. That's why B is different. So again, this is just another reason to learn the modes. I know this is like a very lengthy explanation, but I think these are just different ways to kind of look at chord theory and how you might want to approach learning different chords in a progression or a key. So when I say this, it's like having a B minor and then adding its flat 2, because if we look at the B... Phrygian mode we have a flat two. So again, you might not have learned anything from that. You could have been like, wow, that's just like a long drawn out explanation of whatever. But I think a lot of really just teaching guitar and learning on the internet versus having like in-person lessons where someone can diagnose exactly where you're at and what you need to hear is really just talking about things in different ways. So one of the one of the complaints that people say are like, oh, you're talking over my head or you're not dumbing it down enough. I'm kind of operating under the assumption that Everybody is at a different spot. So maybe being like, oh, the third degree in any key actually doesn't have a minor nine chord on it, has this flat two in it. Well, maybe that's something that puts the puzzle piece of like, oh, so that's what B Phrygian actually means and how I can use that in the context of my playing. So I realize that we're probably gonna lose some people along the way, but that's just kind of how it works. So keep hitting me with those questions. And I'll keep giving you these long meandering answers. You can improve your head in four minutes by getting a Cubs half. So uh, this is in response to the video on Monday where I was wearing a Yankees hat. I'm not a Yankees fan. I think I might have talked about this a while. I, I am actually a Cubs fan. I'm from Chicago. I mean, I'm not even really a baseball fan anymore. But I love wearing the Yankees hat just because it trolls people so hard. And everyone gets so upset whenever I wear a Yankees hat. <laughs> that the hits just keep on coming. So... Again, if you need to know where my sports allegiances lie, they're generally Chicago. I'm from, I am from Chicago. So, you know, Bears, Bulls, Cubs, whatever. NBA, it's like whatever with the Bulls. I was definitely a huge Bulls fan growing up. I'm just more a fan of the league now, so you can call that fair weather or not. But uh, that's, that's where we are. Analog drum machine or beat buddy? I have no drum skills, but would like to have some drums to play along to. So you may have heard me mention having an analog drum machine. I'm gonna do a video on that really soon. I have the Arturia Drum Brute, which is awesome. They dropped the price to only 350 now. It's fantastic. But the difference between having like a beat buddy, which is a really cool pedal that has a bunch of beats programmed, you can kind of program your own stuff in there. I would say a beat buddy is more of a tool to practice along with, for sure, whereas an analog drum machine is more of an instrument. The really cool thing about having an analog drum machine is you can manipulate stuff and really use it as a performance. I wouldn't say that a beat buddy is as much of a performance tool. I know you can use it like that, but 
That, that's more of like just kind of like playing along to drums. So if you're just looking to play along to, to drums, I think a beat buddy is like a cool option. But most things that the beat buddy can do, an analog drum machine can do, except you can't really change how the drums sound on a drum brew unless you kind of get pedals and stuff involved. But uh, I'm a huge fan of analog drum machines and there's gonna be some content coming with that very soon, so stay tuned. Most underappreciated guitar pedal or effect? I have two answers for this. One of them is gonna be a clean boost. I really thought that a clean boost was kind of like something I would not be interested in, something that if you're not playing electric guitar live, you don't even need. I was very wrong about that. The Walrus Emissary, Walrus sent me an Emissary kind of clean boost pedal with a little bit of a EQ bump in there. And the thing is awesome, specifically if you play a single coil guitar, it just hits your amp or hits your pedals harder and it, it boosts the signal. Again, it doesn't seem very, very sexy. It is underappreciated. It just makes my Strat sound better. It's hard for me to go back to playing my Strat without the clean boost on because that pedal is so awesome. In a similar vein, I think having a compressor pedal is something that every guitarist could actually use. And it just, you know, I, I wouldn't say it to use it as a way to correct your playing dynamics, but I think it just kind of adds like a professional sheen to it when used properly. I have uh, an Empress compressor on my board that, again, if, if I only had a few pedals to take with me, that Empress compressor would be on there. So I think compressors and clean boosts are probably two of the most underrated, underappreciated effects pedals that I can think of. Which Radiohead album do you listen to the most between the two, the Benz or OK Computer? 100% OK Computer, love the Benz. I really like all Radiohead albums that aren't named Pablo Honey. Uh, King of Limbs is probably whatever, but everything else is fantastic. I just don't really listen to the Benz that much. Uh, OK Computer is just where it's at. I love OK Computer, you can't really say that it's even overrated even though it gets put on the top of like all these you know all-time lists and stuff like that it's just such a diverse album with so much depth that i really think people think of it as one of the best albums of all time starts off with airbag which is one of my all-time favorite songs and it just rocks from from there on out so okay computer all the way for listening homework i'm going to throw you to the new song by grimes I think Grimes is a really cool artist that I've talked about before, but I'm digging her new stuff. So make sure you check that out. Make sure you check out the video I did about building my fantasy rig because I just found out it is American, uh, America only as far as entering the contest, but eh, it's really cool because you have a chance to win a bunch of stuff. So check that out. And if you have any questions or comments, hit me up in the comment section, Instagram, Twitter, or the website. I'll talk to you all soon. Thanks a lot.